plants and animals require nourishment for growth. This nourishment is provided to them in the form of chemical substances called nutrients. Let us learn about the ones that are essential for the growth of plants. Nourishment is the process of absorption of various mineral ions by the plants for their growth and development. Plants absorb inorganic elements like hydrogen, oxygen, carbon and nitrogen from air or water. Water absorbed from the soil contains dissolved nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium and magnesium amongst others. As the sources of these inorganic elements are minerals, the elements are called mineral nutrients and thus the nutrition is known as mineral nutrition. Roots absorb 60 of the 105 elements found in nature. However, only 17 of them are considered essential for plant growth and development. In 1939, Arnon and Stout proposed the characters that make an element essential to a plant. The element must be absolutely essential for supporting normal growth and reproduction, which cannot proceed without it. The requirement of the element must be specific and cannot be replaceable by another element. The element must be directly involved in the metabolism of the plant. Based on the above criteria, the essential elements are further divided into macronutrients and micronutrients. The elements that are required by a plant in large amounts are called macronutrients. Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, potassium, calcium, and magnesium are macronutrients. Plant tissues contain more than 10 m mole per kg of dry weight in macronutrients. Of these, carbon, hydrogen and oxygen are mainly obtained from CO2 and H2O, while the others are absorbed from the soil. The elements that are required in minute quantities are called micronutrients or trace elements. Iron, manganese, copper, molybdenum, zinc, boron, chlorine and nickel are examples of micronutrients. Plant tissues contain less than 10 m mole per kg of dry matter. In addition to the 17 essential elements, there are some beneficial elements such as sodium, silicon, cobalt and selenium. Higher plants require them for their metabolism. Essential elements have different functions based on which they are classified as structural elements of cells, components of energy releasing chemical compounds, activator or inhibitor of enzymes, and elements that maintain osmotic potential. Elements like carbon, hydrogen, oxygen and nitrogen are the components of biomolecules that are essential to a plant. Elements like magnesium and phosphorus are the components of energy releasing chemical compounds like chlorophyll and ATP. Magnesium is an activator for enzymes like 
ribulose biphosphate, carboxylase, oxygenase, and phosphoenol pyruvate carboxylase. Potassium is responsible for the opening and closing of the stomata. Minerals as solutes play an important role in maintaining the water potential of a cell. Even small amounts of minerals in a plant can be detected using modern techniques. The elements that are required by plants in large amounts are called macronutrients. Examples are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, potassium, calcium and magnesium. They are used as building blocks and their unavailability leads to retarded development of the plant. The concentration of essential elements below which plant growth is retarded is termed as critical concentration. Each nutrient assists in a particular growth area and hence the deficiency of each element creates different symptoms in a plant. The symptoms disappear once the deficient element is supplied. The parts of the plant that show the symptoms of deficiency also depend on the mobility of the element in the plant. Elements with more mobility export to younger leaves, making older leaves prone to symptoms. Younger leaves get affected in case of a less mobile element. Let us take a look at macronutrients and the symptoms of their deficiency in plants. Macronutrients like carbon, hydrogen and oxygen are derived by plants from water and by gaseous exchange. They become the important constituents of carbohydrates, proteins and fats. Nitrogen, the other important macronutrient, is obtained from soil either in the form of nitrate, nitrite or ammonium salts. Nitrogen is required in all parts of a plant's body. It is mainly found in meristematic tissues and biomolecules like proteins, nucleic acids, vitamins, hormones, coenzymes and ATP. The deficiency of these elements leads to symptoms like stunted growth, chlorosis and inhibition of cell division. Phosphorus is absorbed by plants from the soil in the form of phosphate ions. It is required more in younger tissues like root tip and stem tip. It promotes healthy root growth and fruit ripening. It is an important constituent of cell membranes, nucleic acids, nucleotides and coenzymes. Phosphorus is required in all phosphorylation reactions of the plant. The deficiency of phosphorus causes symptoms like loss of older leaves, poor growth, dull green coloration of older leaves and yellow coloration of lower leaves. Potassium sulfate and potassium nitrate supply the plant with potassium. It is required by meristematic tissues, buds, leaves and root tips. It helps to maintain the anion cation balance in cells. It is involved in protein synthesis, opening and closing of the stomata, activation of enzymes and maintenance of turgidity of cells.
The deficiency of potassium leads to chlorosis, necrosis, rosette or bushy habit of growth, reduction in stem growth, and inhibition of cell division. Plants obtain sulfur from the soil. Growing parts like stem tips, root tips, and young leaves require sulfur. It is a constituent of amino acids like cysteine and methionine, making it an important part of proteins. Vitamins like thiamine, biotin, and coenzyme A also have sulfur. Sulfur deficiency leads to symptoms like chlorosis and inhibition of cell division. Calcium is absorbed by plants in the form of calcium ions from calcium carbonate. It is needed in meristematic tissues and differentiating tissues. It accumulates in older leaves. Calcium plays an important role in cell division. It synthesizes pectin in the middle lamella of the cell wall and helps in the formation of the mitotic spindle. It is involved in selective permeability of cell membranes. It activates certain enzymes like ATPase. The deficiency of calcium leads to the death of meristematic tissues, stunted growth, and necrosis. Magnesium is absorbed as exchangeable cations in the soil. It is a constituent of chlorophyll in leaves. Magnesium maintains the ribosome structure and activates the enzymes of respiration and photosynthesis. It is also involved in the synthesis of nucleic acids. The deficiency of magnesium leads to symptoms like chlorosis and necrosis. This leads to withering of leaves. The elements that are required in minute quantities by plants are called micronutrients or trace elements. Some examples are iron, manganese, copper, molybdenum, zinc, boron, chlorine, and nickel. In plants, they occur as the constituents of enzymes that catalyze biological reactions and are present throughout the body of a plant. Let's take a look at micronutrients in detail. Iron is taken in by plants in the form of ferric ions. It is seen along the leaf veins and is a constituent of ferredoxin and cytochromes. It activates the enzyme catalase and is essential for the formation of chlorophyll. It is reversibly oxidized from Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus during electron transfer. The deficiency of this element leads to symptoms like chlorosis in young leaves, necrosis, and inhibition of chloroplast formation. Manganese is another trace element which is absorbed as manganese ions. It is required in leaves and seeds. It activates enzymes like carboxylases, oxidases, dehydrogenases, peroxidases and kinases. It plays an important role in the splitting of water to liberate oxygen during photosynthesis. Deficiency symptoms include chlorosis, gray spots on leaves and poor development of the root system. 
plants obtain the micronutrient zinc as Zn2 plus ions. It activates enzymes such as carboxylases, part of carbonic anhydrous, and dehydrogenases. It takes part in the formation of tryptophan, a precursor for the plant growth hormone auxin. Deficiency symptoms include chlorosis, formation of smaller leaves, and shortened internodes. Copper is another trace element absorbed from the soil. It is absorbed as cupric ions. It is reversibly oxidized from Cu plus to Cu2 plus. It activates enzymes like tyrosinase, phenolases, and ascorbic acid oxidase. Deficiency symptoms include chlorosis of leaves followed by necrosis. Boron is absorbed by plants from the soil. Plants require boron in its leaves and seeds. It is required for the uptake and utilization of calcium, pollen germination, cell elongation, cell differentiation, and carbohydrate translocation. Deficiency symptoms of boron include cracking of stem and curling of leaves. Molybdenum is absorbed by plants in the form of molybdate ions. It is particularly needed in the roots. It plays an important role in nitrate reduction and nitrogen fixation. It activates nitrogenase and nitrate reductase which participate in nitrogen metabolism. Deficiency symptoms include chlorosis and inhibition of cell division. Chlorine is absorbed in the form of chloride anion Cl- with Na+, and K+, chlorine helps in determining the solute concentration and the anion-cation balance in the cells. It is essential for water splitting and oxygen evolution in photosynthesis. The deficiency of chlorine leads to wilting of leaves. Nickel is absorbed in the form of Ni2+. It is required by leaves, shoot, and seeds. Seeds need nickel to germinate. The deficiency of nickel leads to a failure in the production of viable seeds. Let us consider a different case in which there is an increase in the micronutrients. This is termed as toxicity. Any mineral ion concentration in tissues that reduces their dry weight by about 10% is considered toxic. Toxicity levels differ from plant to plant. In soybean, Manganese is toxic at a concentration beyond 600 mg per gram. The sunflower plant shows toxicity symptoms only beyond 5300 mg per gram. Sometimes, due to the excess concentration of an element, the uptake of another element may decrease. For example, Excess manganese competes with iron and magnesium for nutrient uptake. The excess manganese also competes with magnesium. Manganese toxicity results in brown spots in leaves and chlorosis. Excess manganese in plants checks the flow of chlorine to the shoot apex. That is why manganese in toxic concentrations leads to deficiency of iron, magnesium, and calcium. Studies on the mechanism of absorption of elements in plants have revealed two main phases of absorption. The first phase is a passive process, and the second phase 
is an active process. The first phase involves a rapid uptake of ions from the soil or atmosphere to the outer or free space of cells called the apoplast. The second phase is the slow movement of the ions from the outer space to the inner space of cells, the symplast. Let us learn about the passive and active transport of elements in detail. The first phase involves the movement of elements into the cell wall and intercellular spaces. The absorption of ions happens through the ion exchange process. The passive movement of ions into the outer space of the plasma membrane usually occurs through ion channels. Cations and anions have the tendency to get absorbed into the root cell wall. These ions get exchanged with the ions in the soil solution. The transmembrane proteins in the ion channel function as selective pores. For example, K plus can be exchanged with the H plus ions from the cell. The second phase involves the entry or exit of ions to and from the symplast. This requires the expenditure of metabolic energy and hence it is an active process. The movement of ions from the outer space of the cell to the inner space is generally against the concentration gradient and hence requires energy. This happens through the carrier mechanism. The carrier gets activated by the expenditure of energy from the ATP molecule. The activated carrier molecule binds with the ions and transfers it into the cell. The movement of ions is called flux. The inward movement into the cells is called influx and the outward movement is called efflux. The movement of ions from the root cells to other parts of the plant happens through the xylem tissue. The xylem carries the ions along with water. This is called translocation. Translocation is aided by transpiration. An analysis of water in the xylem shows the presence of mineral salts. Soil provides stability to a plant along with air and water. It is a reservoir of all the major nutrients needed for the plant. Soil is formed by the weathering of rocks which provides the soil with minerals. This is termed as mineral nutrition. Soil also contains microbes such as nitrogen fixing bacteria which help plants by fixing nitrogen from the atmosphere into the soil. The deficiency of minerals in the soil affects the plant and hence fertilizers that have the deficient mineral are added to the soil. This ensures the supply of the deficient element to the plant. Nitrogen is an important element for living organisms. As it is an essential constituent of amino acids, nucleic acids, alkaloids, chlorophylls, vitamins and hormones. It is one of the major constituents in the atmosphere and comprises 78% of all gases by volume. However, atmospheric nitrogen cannot be used by plants. Only a small amount of nitrogen is present in soil and plants compete with microorganisms for it. Atmospheric nitrogen is in the form of elemental nitrogen which requires a large amount of energy to break it into forms suitable for living organisms to absorb. In nature, Elemental nitrogen is converted into oxides with the help of electrical nitrogen fixers 
such as lightning, thunder, and ultraviolet radiation. Some of these nitrogen oxides are brought to earth by precipitation as rainfall. But most of it is biochemically fixed by microorganisms. This is called biological nitrogen fixation. Plants absorb nitrogen in the form of nitrates through their roots, which then transport it to the leaves. Nitrogen in plants reaches animals through the food they eat. When plants and animals die, the organic material in them returns to the soil. The nitrogen in dead plants and animals is decomposed by ammonifying bacteria to form ammonia. This process is called ammonification. Ammonia formed by ammonification is converted into nitrites and nitrates by nitrifying bacteria in the soil. This is called nitrification. During the nitrifying process, chemoautotrophic bacteria such as nitrosomonas and nitrococcus act on ammonia and oxidize it into nitrite. Nitrites are further oxidized into nitrates by the bacterium nitrobacter. Nitrates in soil are either taken up by plants or are processed by denitrifying bacteria which release them as elemental nitrogen into the atmosphere. This process is called denitrification. Examples of denitrifying bacteria are Pseudomonas, Thiobacillus and Micrococcus. Now let's quickly recap the nitrogen cycle. Atmospheric nitrogen is fixed into ammonia biologically by microorganisms. Industries, forest fires, automobile exhaust and power generating stations also release oxides of nitrogen into the atmosphere through combustion. Ammonia in soil is converted into nitrites and nitrates by nitrifying bacteria, thereby enabling plants to absorb nitrates from the soil. Nitrogen compounds from plants are passed along the food chain to animals, which ultimately return it to the soil when they die. Nitrogen from the dead and decaying organic matter is converted into ammonia by ammonification. Denitrifying bacteria then convert the nitrates back into nitrogen. In nitrogen cycle, we learned that air is a very rich source of nitrogen. The use of microorganisms is one way to make atmospheric nitrogen available to the soil. Let us study this process in detail. In the atmosphere, Nitrogen is available in diatomic form. Only a few microbes can fix this nitrogen. These microbes have a special enzyme called nitrogenase, which reduces nitrogen to ammonia. The process by which these living organisms fix atmospheric nitrogen by converting it to ammonia is called biological nitrogen fixation. Nitrogenase is sensitive to oxygen. Even low concentrations of oxygen can make it irreversibly inactive. Microbes that possess this enzyme are called nitrogen fixers. Nitrogen fixers live independently or as symbionts. Examples of free-living aerobic nitrogen fixers are bacteria such as Azotobacter, Clostridium, Klebsiella, and blue-green algae such as Anabina and Nostoc.
The bacteria Rhodospirulum is an anaerobic nitrogen fixing agent, but it can also exist in aerobic conditions. Nitrogen fixation is slow in free living microbes due to the energy requirements. Nitrogen reduction needs ATP to supply energy. Some nitrogen fixing bacteria exist as symbionts. Rhizobium is known for its symbiotic association in the root nodules of leguminous plants such as beans, peanuts, lentils and so on. Non-leguminous plants such as alder, alnus, ceonathus also associate with franchia in the nodules of their roots for nitrogen fixation. These nodules in cross-section appear red or pink due to the presence of an iron-containing protein called leg hemoglobin. Let us take a look at how rhizobium helps plants. Rhizobium in the soil multiplies around the roots and gets attached to root hair or epidermal cells. Root hairs curl, indicating the presence of bacteria. These bacteria reach the cortical cells through this root hair. Then the bacteria stimulate the inner cortical and pericycal cells to divide. These cells get differentiated as nitrogen fixing cells and a nodule is thus formed. Through vascular supply, the nodule is ensured of nutrients and energy from the plant. The enzyme secreted by rhizobium, nitrogenase, is a molybdenum ferrum protein and acts as a catalyst in the conversion of nitrogen to ammonia. As nitrogen is, is sensitive to oxygen, the nodules are adapted to protect the enzyme from exposure to oxygen. Leg hemoglobin the iron containing protein in the root nodule acts as an oxygen scavenger and prevents its exposure to nitrogenase. Nitrogen requires 8 electrons, 8 protons and 16 ATP molecules of energy for the formation of 2 molecules of ammonia. Therefore, 1 molecule of ammonia requires 8 molecules of ATP. These 8 ATP molecules are provided by the ATP released during respiration. Let's see how the enzyme nitrogenase converts nitrogen to ammonia. Nitrogenase first binds with substrate nitrogen and reduces it by adding two hydrogen atoms during each of the three stages until it finally forms two molecules of ammonia. After that, the enzyme is re-released to bind to another molecule of nitrogen. In physiological pH conditions of the plant, ammonia molecules take up protons to form ammonium or NH4 plus ions that are channelized and used in the synthesis of amino acids. The ammonium ion ultimately forms the amine group of the amino acid. Amino acid synthesis in plants takes place in two ways, reductive amination and transamination. When ammonium ions react with alpha-ketoglutaric acid, it reduces it to an amine and forms glutamic acid and water in the presence of the enzyme glutamate dehydrogenase. Hence, this reaction is called reductive amination. The energy required for this reaction is obtained by the oxidation of NADPH to NADP. Transamination involves the transfer of one amino group from an amino acid to the keto group of a keto acid. The reaction is catalyzed by a family of enzymes called transaminases. This is analogous to a double displacement reaction 
where there is an exchange of an amine group of one amino acid with a keto group of a keto acid. This results in the formation of asparagine and glutamine. From aspartic acid and glutamic acid. This process takes place due to the replacement of the hydroxyl group of the carboxyl group of aspartic and glutamic acids with the amino group. Amino acids are usually transported through phloem, but compounds such as amides and ureides, owing to a greater nitrogen to carbon ratio, are easily transported through xylem.